Hey, it's James Arnold Taylor, the voice of Obi-Wan Kenobi and Master Poe Cool in Star Wars The Clone Wars, and you're listening to Everything Geek, the podcast. Jackpot with the Everything Geek Podcast. Hello, everyone. You're listening to the Everything Geek Podcast. I'm your host, Rory, and joining me today is a very special guest. We have actor Peter Shinkoda, who is best known for playing Nobu in the Daredevil series, Die in Falling Skies. Rain in Mighty Morphin Power Rangers and Last Rider, Mewtwo Crows, Test Tech 1 in Godzilla, and Sector in Mortal Kombat Legacy. So how are you today, Peter? Well, Rory. Thanks for You're very welcome. It's a pleasure to have you join us on the podcast today. It's, it's a pleasure to always uh, you know, be in demand. It's, it's crazy and uh, still very surreal to me. Definitely. It's a great way to look at things when you're in demand. So... <laughs> Moving right on to my first question for you, Peter. My first question is, how did you decide you wanted to become an actor? Ooh, um, well, I was a fan, uh, I suppose, just just like you and billions of other people out there in the world. I started off just becoming really obsessed with uh, you know, television uh, first and, and then films to the point where I was very obsessive. Uh, this, the, the, my favorite thing to do in life was to go watch movies sometimes three in a row. I'd just sit there and, you know, lie down and um, hide between the chairs in the goo, you know, in, in the popcorn and, and, and the dried up syrupy pop, soft drinks, and garbage. And I'd just watch movies um, so incessantly. And it came to a point where um, it was obvious to me that uh, on television I wasn't very satisfied. I wasn't very convinced with a lot of the the Asian roles that uh, that I was witnessing, and it kind of uh, that, that that evolved into a kind of a um, uh, I say I was I was disappointed in a lot of the um, these roles, and I felt that maybe perhaps I had the goods to go and uh, participate, you know, in making these movies as, as opposed to being just a viewer and maybe perhaps change things because I thought I could do a better job or at least convince Hollywood to do a better portrayal of Asian Americans. It was very, um, I was, I was actually very sad because I loved movies so much and and I I admired everything that was done in Hollywood and TV and films, except the one aspect of uh, how they reflected upon me as, as a person. And I felt that maybe I could change some things because I never experienced any kind of weird any real harsh racism or anything. I had a very charmed life and uh, you know, surrounded by really great people up here in Canada and friends. Um, and I just thought, uh, you know, I wanted to just give a, a, a better representation of what it was like to be at least an Asian American or Asian Canadian. So um, I, I, I migrated there and uh, still giving it my best shot. It's really interesting, not just because you were a fan of movies yourself when you were younger, and that's why I wanted to, like, to become an actor, but, you know, the way you wanted to see a better portrayal of um, Asians in in movies, I think that's actually really great and well done for it that, you know, it was because... Also, of course, I, you know, I, I have little incidents of, uh, you know, the racism directed towards me, and I felt that if I could change it and put stronger characters up there, that uh, not only would I, you know, it wouldn't be like beating somebody up in the, the schoolyard and then getting the respect of the schoolyard. You know, there's a big reach in Hollywood. They're very influential. And um, I thought that if you could beat somebody up and the whole world sees it, you'll gain that much more respect. You know, it's just it's just a bigger reach. It's more widespread, uh, the messages that they, um, they, they uh, put out there. So I felt that uh, it was kind of like winning a big fight in the schoolyard of the world, you know, so... <laughs> Yeah, it was absolutely. Never about money. It was never about fame. 
you can take my name away or anything. If if there was a bunch of guys, or if there was twenty Bruce Lees out there, but not necessarily fighting uh, with with the you, know, you know this one character that uh, was strong and 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 a very good, very good representation. But uh, you know it's also one dimensional uh, that that version of the Asian man. Um, you know, there's other guys that could be lawyers. Uh, they can be even villains. I mean, um, but he was definitely a strong. Uh, you know, a symbol for Asian men, and certainly the one only guy that I could look up to until like Jackie Chan, Jet Li came out. But uh, you know, those are also foreign films. But um, at least the one, Into the Dragon, the one with uh, from Warner Brothers. You know, you, you saw that. Um, I wasn't alive, but uh, my understanding is when it came out, you know, kids, uh, everybody in the United States had a pair of nunchucks. You know, you could walk down Hollywood Boulevard or through anywhere in Los Angeles and every kid had nunchucks. That's how influential Hollywood is. Um, but, you know, growing up, I had, you know, Indiana Jones and Han Solo, Luke Skywalker. I had all these Caucasian characters that I loved, you know. I just thought it was a little a little unfair in the playing field. So I figured, uh, you know, I'd go there. And um, maybe maybe I had uh, the, well, the, the prerequisites to, to being, you know, to, to being perhaps a strong character in, in a Hollywood film or television show. But uh, Bruce Lee was the only one. I thought that was not enough, you know. And again, it was only one side of the strong guy, the guy that can, you know, talk with his fists. There's other guys that are, uh, you know, that are political act activists or perhaps doctors and lawyers. You can do, you can be strong and influential and, uh, and, and respected in many ways. But, uh, you know, it's growing. I mean, it's things. Times are changing, and uh, I love, I love, um, you know, the the trajectory that Hollywood is taking right now. So, definitely, that's a really good answer. Thank you for that. Moving on to my second question: How were you initially cast as Nobu in the Daredevil um, series? It was very, uh, you know, straightforward, standard um, process. I uh, have uh, reps, manager, and agent, and. Um, well, the cat's out of the bag now. They uh, they, they said, uh, listen, we have the show. It's called, you know, Wink, Wink, Daredevil. And uh, it's, 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 it's tentative name. At the time, uh, it was um, uh, Bluff. as a blind man's bluff. Pretty clever, right? So even in our, uh, even in our correspondences online, you know, in the subject line, it would be Bluff. Uh, actually, they didn't tell me it was Daredevil at the beginning. But when I read it, it rang like um, it rang like uh, Daredevil because I had uh, several uh, auditions uh, before I even knew I was playing this character Nobu. In fact, a couple maybe a few days before I shot, I didn't even know my character's name was Nobu. I thought it was Hachiro, just like the press had uh, had um, the leaked maybe a year before, or you know, right when we uh, we began shooting in New York City, they said that it was Hachiro. Of course, Marvel. Um, they're, they're a wide bunch over there, and I guess they released Hachiro. Uh, the thing, it was called, I was called Hachiro, I understand, because my second audition, I had a role, and I had my material that I had to audition for, and it was Hachiro. But the first one uh, I got was a guy, it, 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 I forget the name of it, but it was actually Wesley's dialogue. It was um, this long, long, probably the longest scene he ever had, and all Wesley's scenes are long. But one of his introduction scenes where he comes in to a very fledgling uh, Nelson and Murdoch uh, law firm and he goes and he kind of interviews them almost. But, you know, he's offering them a, a job to uh, to work for, um, I think, uh, for uh, the, the well, Kingpin's company or another, one of the bigger, the, the company that Marcy works for. He wanted to uh, bring them in on that legal team and he kind of was... Um, cross-examining them to see if they were, uh, you know, of the right uh, frame of mind to work for him because um, they wanted them on their side. So anyways, it was that scene, and it was maybe six, seven pages that was done that was acted brilliantly by uh, Toby Leonard Moore, who's just a genius actor and, and just an all-around nice guy, but it was his dialogue. And I went in and read for that, and I'm like, I don't look like a Wesley. He sounds perhaps uh, Irish. Irish American, I don't know, but um, when I said Wesley, I'm like, this is Daredevil, because he was talking to two lawyers, right? So I put it together, and then I saw the subject, you know, the subject line in the email was bluffed. So I'm like, I'm reading for Daredevil, man. I gotta be. 
So I read all that as as an Asian American Wesley, and I guess I impressed upon them enough that they they called me, uh, they recontacted me, and asked me to read for another role, and that again was Wesley's material. When he goes up and uh, very uh, sinister like um, tells that uh, the the, the uh, beat cop at the beginning that he has to carry out an assassination of uh, Karen Page in in the uh, in her cell in the, um, the pilot episode, and I read that as a sinister Japanese guy. His, and on the material on, on, uh, that they sent me, it was said, it was, I was told that the character was Hachiro. So I read it very sinister like um, with a Japanese accent. And then I was told that uh, they were interested in signing me, and that was it. Um, then weeks went by, and I eventually got to New York, and I was sent um, the first script a few days before we were shooting, and I had to call my reps and say, you know what, there's a guy that's described here. <laughs> in, in the script, it sounds exactly, well, it, it describes me physically, except this guy's not talking. He's just standing around making mean faces and uh, saying that, you know, he's very alert and he's almost superhuman and he can see everything and read everybody and what, he doesn't feel cold. I'm like, I was very concerned for a few moments, but I called my reps. They uh, called on a Sunday night. They called Marvel at their uh, production office in, um, in Brooklyn and they were reluctant to my reps. I said, I don't care. It's Sunday nights. We're shooting in a few days. I need to know because, um, listen, I didn't walk into this agreement. You know, I don't know what's going on. I knew I had pages of dialogue. It turns out that, you know, I, they explained to me that uh, I was going to become this noble character. And uh, and that was exciting to me because I'm like, ooh, I could be a supervillain here. You know, but they're, they're holding all their cards very close to their, their chest, Marvel. But uh, they answered that night. Very readily they answered uh, my reps and um, gave me the real answer. And uh, he... That was it. I walked into the production. I was I was pleased with it. Um, I met Toby, and uh, he knocked it out of the park. Every moment he's on screen, uh, he's just just a just a, an amazing actor. And uh, I eventually learned from the bunch of personalities working on the show that uh, they did that uh, as a weeding out process, and they had to know that the the actor you know could um, act. <laughs> And it was just uh, you know a testing process, and they um, I guess they were convinced because I handled a bunch of Wesley's um, scenes as as the you know as as uh, as well as I could, and then you know I delivered with the um, the Japanese uh, version of it in the next uh, in, in the next uh, the, the elimination round, uh, I guess. So that was it, you know. It was kind of grueling, and uh, I was in the dark, but uh, it ended up well, and I'd do it all over again because hey, man. I'm a super villain, you know, so <laughs> that's how it happened. Uh, really. It's very interesting. It definitely sounded like it was a long, grueling process and a lot of waiting. No, they moved pretty quickly, yeah. but I was like, um, I have to jump through hoops here. I'll, you know, and, and I would have because I knew I've been following Marvel since I was a child. And uh, just, you know, a few months previous to this, this whole auditioning process, I had known that the property, the IP had returned back to into it had gone back at the Marvel's hands from uh, Sony Columbia, you know. After they they didn't um, they weren't uh, they didn't have um, a new uh, Daredevil reboot on the slate of production, right? And they had to to keep their keep their rights to it. They had to um, they had to revisit again, and I don't think that they were uh, they were ready to do that, Sony. So they turned it over back to Marvel. Move, Marvel moved fast on it. I heard they were going to make a feature. Then you know. I didn't hear anything else other than that, uh, you know, Marvel was going to do a bunch of uh, shows in New York. And then all of a sudden, you know, a few weeks later, I'm getting this opportunity to read. And then I knew that it was Daredevil. I'm like, I'll do anything to be in the show. I mean, Daredevil is one of my favorite. Like, I read all comics, DC as well. Um, anything I could get my hands on. But, you know, I was spending all my allowance on Spider-Man, Amazing Spider-Man, Spectacular Spider-Man, Spider-Man's Amazing Friends, Daredevil, X-Men, New Mutants. Um, you know, and Wolverine, those are my favorites. So to to live, uh, to be flesh and blood in, in a live action Daredevil, I would have given my, you know, I would have given my left, my left arm. Believe me, it's, it's still a dream. I'm sure. Well, thankfully for our listeners, if you watch Daredevil, you will see Peter still yeah, yeah. has his arm. So. Well, I don't know. It's kind of crispy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. 
That is very true. Moving on to my third question, can you talk about the filming process for the fight scene in yeah, Nobu's last episode? <laughs> it was, uh, well, you know, everything was ramping up to that because I appeared in five of the episodes. Um, and again, between eight and nine, like I was guaranteed five episodes, which uh, Marvel fulfilled. And um, I was on my uh, fourth. And of course, in preparation for the following episode, episode nine, um, I, you know, I, I, I knew that I was anticipating something big because everybody's going, Hey, Pete, did you read episode nine yet? I'm like, no, you should be in the gym. Are you going to the gym? Because when you don't go to the gym, go to the gym. And so I knew that there was something epic was going to happen. Some, some kind of conflict. Um, so that was all I knew, uh, when I eventually did get it, um, to tell you the truth, all credit goes to uh, Christos and, uh, and and Ruth Fletcher Gage, the, the married um, screenwriting uh, head staff writers for the show. They they were responsible for that. They wrote that, and of course, every script has uh, names just below the titles, the writers' names, and that stuck with me right when I when I got that script because I knew it was mine. It was a big one, so they wrote that one. Also, you know, they also do double duty. They also the head staff writers, but they wrote that one specifically together. When I read it, and um, you know, I hear a lot of, uh, you know, I hear a lot of uh, compliments about it. It's the structure of that episode. Uh, I, I read a lot of scripts, and that one, and you know, of course, I read the four that I was only, uh, I only had privy to four, before I, I, the whole Russian storyline. I didn't know, so I was watching that. I I just love those Russian brothers. They were just incredible because that was new to me. I see these guys on set. I know there's something going on. I knew that they're going to be killed by um, by, Mur um, by Daredevil. But uh, they were just amazing episodes too. But I, like I said, I only had four episodes that I had read, the ones that I contributed to. Those are, that was the only, uh, the, the only um, knowledge I had of the storyline. And believe me, it was already very detached because, you know, they were very... Um, uh, I was getting them like in a syncopated way. I was getting one, and then I'd miss one or two, and then I'd get another one. Anyways, when I got eight, I was shooting eight, I got nine. I read it, and I was blown away, not only by the structure, the opening of it, um, but I just loved the way that it teased the audience all the way through uh, with all the time cuts, time jumping, and, um, and then the big reveal at the end of how... how uh, how uh, Matt made his way over to uh, the, to um, this uh, uh, layer at the docks. That was incredibly well done. Um, and, and to tell you the truth, it was very uh, well written. Um, you know, it was kind of pretty visceral in the way you could uh, visualize it as it read on, on off the page. So I had very high hopes. And, um, you know, after reading it, when we did get to... Uh, go to camera and start shooting it. Usually there are eight, maybe nine days, depending on how hard or how big, uh, how epic the episodes are. But that one took a very long time. Um, I spent one day doing, I had this big scene with um, uh, Vincent D'Onofrio. I did that scene where I kind of chew him out and we make plans. We did that right off the bat, one of the first days in the uh, warehouse and then I think we had a weekend and then I started the um, we had to work on a fight scene and we knew that was very difficult from what I'd read and um, you know just all the the physicality of it every every slash is you know of uh, from Nobu delivered uh, onto uh, Daredevil it was written it was all scripted uh, nothing was really improvised if anything was there was you know, it was because uh, they're adding more stunts or more, you know, flips um, on the day. But uh, I went in on that Monday, and we didn't fit on Monday at maybe uh, 7, 8 in the morning. We didn't finish till 1 in the morning Saturday, six days later. And we, uh, I worked hard, but, uh, you know, alongside a crew of maybe 150 people, everybody else worked hard, including the talent in front of the camera, behind the camera. Um, to be honest, uh, I was in there. And uh, I had to do a lot of the fight myself, but a lot of it, a lot of the trick stuff, all the superhuman looking things, they were done by a bunch of guys, uh, you know, stunt guys. I had, there was me and there was three other uh, gentlemen dressed as Nobu as well. There was uh, uh, Philip Silvera, a genius stunt coordinator. Um, 
right now they're coordinating and, and stunt doubling um, Ryan Reynolds as Deadpool. Maybe they're finished shooting right now. But uh, he was there. Um, he choreographed it all, and he was the one most responsible for, for training me, you know, uh, previously uh, on set before we started shooting and uh, during shooting. He had to, uh, you know, he had to school me on the um, the chain and the kyoketsu shoge. That's the Japanese uh, scythe thing with the uh, reverse little dagger on it. As much as people believe, people are, well, you're really good. I didn't know you could uh, operate the chain. A lot of people have come up to me and said that. Whereas I've never swung a chain around at everybody, anybody in my life. Um, but he gave me the training, and he's masterful at that. So we spent uh, a lot of time out in the parking lot. Uh, everybody was standing way back. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a lot of the hand stuff and some of the kicks I did. But to tell you the truth, all the acrobatic stuff, there was another genius, super, uh, you know, skilled uh, fellow named Jim Ng, uh, New York-based uh, uh, a tricker. That's what they call him, a tricker. I think he was on the U.S. tricking team. Like, there's a community of these guys. Uh, you know, there's um, Chris Brewster. He he, he doubled um, Charlie Cox. You know, uh, but my guy, I had three because there was there was um, like I said, Philip Silvera had to do a few of the things of the chain stuff. Any of the little close ups, the hand stuff I was doing. There was other some incredible uh, footwork done. Like I'm talking aerial kicks that were launched off of poles and off of the desk. That was done by Jim Ng, who specializes in that and flipping. Then there was another fellow, and I, oh God, I misplaced his name, I feel bad. Sorry, man. Um, they, they flew in the, uh, the fire stunt man specialist. He, he holds the Guinness World, world, world uh, Record for the longest full body uh, inferno. Anyways, he was flown in, and he had to get lit up twice. So there was a bunch of people. I'm, ta I'm talking. It's a, it was a hugely collaborative process. That whole fight scene. Uh, and then, of course, Charlie was there every minute, you know, of the day as well. So it was it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of work. Um, by the end of the week, you know, I, a lot of my roles, and in real life, I'm very physical. Like, I love the extreme sports, and martial arts, and hockey, especially. I'm really a big hockey fanatic. But I was really feeling it. On Saturday night, and I also had a lot of friends that were in town that were calling me uh, late, mid to late in the week, every night. Are you coming out? Can you meet us? We're at a bar. Pete, we came to New York to see you. I'm like, you came. I, I told you, you know, I'd be very, I'm going to be very busy this week. So I ended up working until like two or three, starting at eight in the morning until two or three, Monday to Friday. When I wrapped at like one, two, three in the morning, I think on Friday night, they asked me to come back again on Saturday to, uh, to get additional little clips that they needed to, you know, enhance the fight. We might have, uh, you know, overlooked them during the, uh, you know, the regular work week. I said, absolutely, I'll come in on Saturday. And that turned out to be, a, you know, a, a very long day as well. But uh, everybody was committed. Everybody was on the same page. And, um, you know, it seems like everybody enjoyed it. But uh, it was a great um, experience, fun process. And I'd do it all over again. Uh, I'll go back anytime they ask me because uh, I love the role. And gee whiz, I'm out there, uh, you know, living my childhood dreams. I'm like, wow, this is a, this is like a frame from a comic book. You know, this is another. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's it was just it was on my bucket list. I wanted to be a superhero with a, in a Marvel show, and uh, I, I remember every minute of those six days. It's, it was just uh, it's a dream. It might have hurt me. I had trouble, you know, a little creaky getting out of the bed in the morning, but uh, it was as fast as I could with all the pain. You know, I'd get out, out of bed and, and, and go to set because uh, I was eager, and so so was everybody. It was just an uh, extremely enjoyable time. Yeah, and I'm not I'm not surprised that, you know, there were so many crew members involved. Like, it's just such a oh, big man. scene, and yeah so interesting that the scene in itself just went on took several days to actually film yeah, that's very it interesting a, it, it was actually uh, a little bit more stuffy later in the week because of the, the fire stunts and uh, they had also paramedics there uh, we had smoke machines and stuff so it got very congested in there we had a bunch you know we got like 12 firemen in there with hoses and stuff and uh, a couple of fire trucks were out there ready to hose people down and uh, you know, we've got swinging chains and stuff and, and breaking, uh, you know, sparks raining down on me and uh, breakaway deaths and, and, and blood packs. And, oh, geez, it was, you know, we have people applying makeup, readjusting my, 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 my ninja hood and, you know, a lot of things 
there's a lot of opportunity for things to go awry and um you know you need hundreds of people there to 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 to, to stay on schedule you know to tweak to you know Final touches is that kind of thing. We need final touches. We need a readjustment of the, a resetting of this. Bring in the rubber, uh, you know, kyoketsu shoge, the rubber knife. Um, you know, so it's like, okay, everybody, you know, freeze that frame. Let's bring in the double. To, you know, there's a lot going on uh, logistically. It's a very difficult sh scene to shoot, difficult scene to to write. But uh, I thought it was executed uh, uh, amazingly, and 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 it seems that uh, you know people are responsive, very uh, responsive in a positive way. So I'm happy about that. Definitely, I completely agree. It was a really well done fight scene. And in sticking with them, um, but talking about the fight scene, the episode starts with the fight scene before other scenes are shown later in the episode, which lead up to the fight. Do you remember if the scenes were filmed in order of how they appeared in the episode, or in the order of the events taking um, place? Truth, um, a lot of the stuff that happened in between the fight, I guess that was shot uh, previously and quickly because um, they're obviously they're just a lot easier to shoot. Uh, then they, I guess it was scheduled uh, so that uh, the production would concentrate heavily on this fight. Now. Uh, like I mentioned before, yeah, when I read it, it, it kind of, it, it read backwards and there was time cuts and um, generally we filmed it in the order of the actual fight if it happened. Like I said, I, I did have this scene where I, uh, where I meet up with Fisk and I'm less than impressed. We shot that. We moved on to the fight, I think, yes, one of the first scenes that I shot was... Uh, was uh, my, my, my reveal inside that little cubby hole thing where um, where Matt Murdock comes up and he, he senses my heartbeat. We did shoot that first. And then I, it is true that we stayed in order because the next scene I shot, and I think this is the only time we used wires in that scene, uh, one of the opening attacks in the scene, I do this power slide. <laughs> and I slide by him and I give him a back kick into his back. And he uh, he goes down on the ground, and then I approach him again. I, I sweep his legs from out under him. Only in that shot there was uh, some wires, so that he would do a like, complete somersault in the air, and I give him a I give him a punch, and then it cuts to the uh, the Daredevil credits that was all written, second by second. It was like I, I give a punch to him, and uh, he spits blood out, and then it cuts to the uh, the. the the gorgeous Daredevil opening credits. So we did shoot that next. Then after that, pretty much in chronological order. But then again, we're skipping here and there because it's very hard to keep tabs on every moment. And every moment is like a million years in a fight because it's all done with like little clips, you know. Uh, you can't just hold a camera, uh, you know, for pages and pages and pages on a fight. You can't do that. Um, as it's described... So much has happened second to second in, in a fight scene. Um, so it had to be kind of approached as meticulously as possible, but some things do fall through the cracks. So on, as the days proceeded in shooting, every once in a while we'd have to go back and go, okay, did we get that little you know, sequence, that little clip, because we need to connect that to this. If you, so, but generally we were shooting in, in the order of the fight if it wasn't interrupted by editing. We were shooting it pretty close to because I remember the last thing that we did was also the fire um, I remember that going don't don't make me lie crispy on the ground with, you know with black carbon and gunk all over me and it's funny because in the, in the end episode the, the noble burning on the ground is only alluded to by uh, you know the by Wesley and uh, Wilson Fist eyeline when he says let him burn that part I don't know if there was a dummy on the ground or not, but it certainly wasn't me because I wasn't there. I had wrapped already. I was happy because I didn't want to lie anymore on the ground burning up. You know, in previous jobs, I've lied on the ground dead. And uh, if I could never do that again in life, I, you know, I, I prefer not to. But um, that was the last scene. I remember not being there as he said that. So I was wrapped actually on the whole show at that point. So, um, yeah, we did it uh, chronologically, to answer your question. Yeah, we shot it pretty much the way that uh, it would have played out in real time if it wasn't edited. 
very interesting. Thank you for that answer. Moving, moving on to my fourth question, Nobu was revealed to have an extensive knowledge of martial arts, which he used in his fight against Daredevil. Did you have to go through much training for this scene, or were you already familiar with martial arts? I think you might have mentioned it briefly uh, yeah, earlier. Well, well, I think I touched on it earlier. Um, yeah, well, as, as, you know, as an Asian kid, and my parents are Japanese, uh, they, uh, of course, I, you know, as a child, I took kendo, but then I moved on to judo, and then I moved on to karate. Karate. And, uh, you know, at that point, it was pretty novel. And everybody expected me to be a martial artist, but uh, I stopped at 15. After with you know, all the fundamental uh, the tools under my belt, I stopped and I really concentrated on the other sports that, uh, that, that I was involved in, that included uh, hockey, football, I was a wide receiver, and then I became a ski instructor because the hockey became too small. But yes, to answer your question, yeah, I did train as a child. But, uh, you know, it's not like I won some Eastern European welterweight uh, kickboxing titles like a lot of these actors claim that they have, you know. Um, a lot of times I'll have to use a lot of my physicality and perhaps martial arts. But when an Asian guy fights on screen, I don't care if he's one of the thousand guys that Blade kills in the Blade movies. You know, the Asian guys with the sunglasses, they're always getting killed. Or you're the lead guy. I don't care. Or, or if the guy, like you're, say you're Brandon Lee in, in, in the showdown of the Little Tokyo, you know, and he gets beaten up more than Dolph Lundgren. So Dolph Lundgren's the master you know, of the martial arts and that. But, anyways, I don't care who you are, what you are. If you're Asian and you're going to be throwing down, if you're going to be fighting in a Hollywood TV show or movie, you're always awesome. And if you're always awesome, they're always going to get the awesomest from around the world, wherever. They'll fly them in. So, to tell you the truth, no matter how good I am, they're always going to enhance my fighting with these genius specialists that are on the Olympic teams. These guys are really on national teams, and they, you know, the, the, the organic segue is to go into show business because they're already in kind of a show business. They go on to do these events. Then they get uh, scouted by, uh, you know, stunt crews and stunt coordinators, and then they, they fall into it like, like, a, like, um, Chris Brewster and uh, Philip Silvera and this Jim Ng, who was a tricker, who was uh, also one of my doubles. These guys all each know know each other from uh, you know the the martial arts circuit since they were five, um, and I see them repeatedly over the years. Uh, I see them all the time because they're always brought into stunt meet, no matter what. And these guys, even if I'm falling off a motorcycle, these guys are coming in, and they're like you know fourth dan black belts and stuff, and you know they fought in the Olympics. These guys are the best in the world. So if you ever see me fight, I don't care if I'm even getting, if I'm getting beaten in a fight and, I'm, and I lose the fight, they're still going to have the best in the world there to step in for me when, uh, when needed, you know? And, and I give all credit to these guys. They're incredible. Like I specialize in acting. Yes, I know martial arts, but in, I can't touch these guys. These guys are assassin deadly, you know? They're just amazing. I stand there too with my mouth agape as well, just like everybody else in the crew going, what the f? You know these guys are incredible. It just they're like godlike in their abilities, and um, you know I applaud them and I thank them because you know their job is to 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 die before me. You know this, they got chains swinging around. You know they could be maimed, blinded. You know seriously hurt at any moment when they step in for me. So uh, I'm very grateful to these these uh, these fellows for doing you know that job and doing it amazingly. You know their job is to is to get hurt for you, you know. If they don't get hurt, they're lucky. That's good. But, um, you know, I, I have much respect for them. They're just amazing at what they do. It's a really good answer. Thank you for that. Moving on to my fifth question. Can you tell us about your experience working under Steven Spielberg as one of the lead characters dying in Falling me? Skies? Oh, of course, of course. Um, that, uh, that, that show, which is airing just started airing uh, its uh, fifth and final season just a couple of days ago. Um, you know, it'll always remain probably the most, uh, was one of the, the best moments of my life. First of all, having landed it, uh, I remember booking the role and I just collapsed to the floor and uh, just cried on the floor for like 20 minutes because, you know, it's been a long road. It's very hard to uh, you know, uh, commend anybody that uh, chases a dream in Hollywood. It's, it was difficult, but I've been, you know, I've been putting it in, I've been putting in the effort for decades, it seems. But um, 
you know, growing up, one of the first movies I saw uh, was Close Encounters. You know, not the theaters. I saw it, uh, you know, it was on TV, movie of the week or something, and um, you know, as well as Jaws, and uh, I saw Indiana Jones and at a drive-in that uh, my parents took me to, and I forced them to hide me in the trunk, even though they said it would be too violent. I said, you, you want to see violence, Mom and Dad? Don't take me to Raiders of the Lost Ark. You're going to see violence. Anyways, I forced them to take me to, <laughs> I told, I forced them to, take me to that, you know, and, of course, I, I also was uh, a, a huge fan of George Lucas at the time, too, but between Spielberg, Rufius, and Stan Lee, I was like, look, you know, they're the best storytellers the universe has ever known, other than Shakespeare. Um, everybody knows who these people are, especially Spielberg and uh, Stan Lee. And Spielberg, I've been a fan since the beginning. You know, I'd be reading the making of, uh, you know, Steven Spielberg films or the Star Wars before the movies even came out. I'd be buying these, the making of books. I have jaw the Jaws log. You know, um, there's uh, there Carl Gottlieb is a good friend of mine now, and he wrote the Jaws log, and he's you know the screenwriter. He adapted the uh, Peter Benchley novel. Um, you know, I have two copies of uh, the Jaws log now. One that I used to ca carry around in, in my back pocket lying around my BMX, you know, in the early 80s. And I also have one that uh, that he FedEx to me a couple of years ago. when I, I um, We had done a couple of interviews together on uh, on Combat Radio. It was a radio show based out of Los Angeles, and I got to know him. He's such a nice guy. And uh, he said that he had a couple left, the actual first print Jaws log paperback, and he sent it to me. He emailed, I mean, he uh, FedEx it to me in L.A. But that's how long, you know, of a fan I had been of, of uh, Steven Spielberg. Um, so when I got that part, it was huge. And that's why it will always, um, it'll always remain like, you know, at the top of the best memories of my life. Because when I landed and I was told that Spielberg saw my audition on tape, I didn't have a screen test or anything. And uh, he just closed his laptop and said, that guy, that Peter should go to give him the part, whatever, book him, contract, get him on a flight. So, I was very happy about that, but the biggest part was getting to set, and he visited on the pilot, Carl Franklin, uh, another great director, he died from the pilot. He, uh, Spielberg came in, he stepped into that, you know, stepped in and kind of directed me in a few key scenes, and that was huge, because when he came to set the first day, I didn't want to meet him at all, and uh, a lot of the PAs, the production assistants with their walkie-talkies kept coming up to me, and they were asking me, did you meet Steven, did you meet Steven yet? And I kept putting it off. Like like a like a like a timid virgin on 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 graduation night, uh, you know. I just didn't want to go through with it because it was uh, so much, so much in the making, you know, this introduction. So eventually, somebody pulled me in and said, "You have to meet Stephen now because your scene's up and he has something to say to you," you know. So I went into the little tent. It was, it was scorching hot in Hamilton, Ontario, um, and he made an introduction. I had uh, maybe you know. Five ten minutes conversation with him, he, and he told me how he concocted this new scene that wasn't in the script. And he's sitting in front of the monitor with Carl Franklin, the director, and um, he did it a few times. And he was yelling out there, "Hey, Peter, you know, do it this way or do it that way." And I'd go, "Yes, sir." And then I turn away and go back to my start mark. But you know, I had a hard time walking back because my my knees were crumbling, and you know, I was almost my lip was trembling because I was going to cry. You know, just standing there and thinking Mr. Steven Spielberg was directing me. And so it was huge um, to be on a production that was, 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 you know, alongside Steven Spielberg's name in the credits is, you know, I, I wish every actor in the world could, you know, have that feeling because um, I know every actor puts effort in and hopes for that, you know, and I guess I got lucky. But uh, I loved uh, every minute of being on the set. I loved... Uh, you know, it was only the first two seasons, but, you know, I really liked the first two seasons as a fan, not not, not as a contributor, but I loved it, and I loved the, the crew and the cast. Um, I made lifelong friendships with everybody, everybody, you know, to tell you the truth, in Hollywood, it's not very often that, um, a, you know, big ensemble cast can get along, um, and, uh, and uh, you know, with, with Falling Skies, we all remain really good friends. We're all dispersed out in the wind, you know. Because, you know, the, the actual show ended filming, I think, in January. But uh, whenever we all get a chance, you know, even if it's a couple of us, we, we try to get together. We all remain very good friends. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing Noah, who I haven't seen in a couple of years, in, in London at the London Comic Con in a couple of weeks. Because he will be in attendance, as will I. 
So that'll be nice. Hope we're going to be able to grab a meal or a pint together. But, uh, yeah, I mean, lifelong friendships. And, uh, you know, I'm happy with the work I did in the first two seasons. And uh, it's continue on. And uh, it's sad that it's going to end. But, uh, you know, five years is a good run. It's a solid run. And uh, hopefully it wraps up really, really well. But uh, it was a great show and uh, great people involved. And only good things to say about that show. That's great. Of course, it's always great to hear when uh, productions, you know, the people involved in it, the cast and crew all get along really well because uh, some people may not be aware that's actually not as common for people to get along for the entire time. It's actually more common for, you know, it's true. them I've not to get along. Guest stars. I've been on other shows where I know the leads hate each other and I'll be walking with one of the leads to, uh, to the set and they'll be spinning on the ground talking about... Uh, you know, the asshole that they have to work with. I'm like, what? Uh, you know, well, geez, you know, let that go. Be happy you're on a show and, uh, you know, try, don't try to get along. But, uh, you know, specifically with me, in the case of Falling Skies, uh, everybody got along, you know, everybody just got along uh, splendidly. And uh, and even though I was on, on the set of Daredevil season one, limitedly, it seemed uh, the same way. Um, I got to meet pretty much all the personalities on, on the show and everybody's just uh, so sweet just 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 nice and uh you know makes all makes it all even better you know makes the dream even better when you go to work on a show like that yeah. so yeah. i'm appreciative and uh you know i don't take it yeah. for granted yeah so on the side yeah, so note and uh, something i should point out actually noah i presume we're talking about noah while of course he actually had to cancel london film and comic con for work commitments so he won't oh, actually be attending now Booker. that's too bad really maybe he's going i know he's involved somewhat in the new tnt show the librarians again so maybe um, that's why or maybe he found out I was going and then he pulled out. I'm not yeah. sure. I'm going to get the thought of this, Laurie. <laughs> that's all. Oh, that's all. <laughs> nah. Oh, well. Yeah, just thought I should, you know, point out before the event, just in case you, you know, someone else didn't what tell you. That yet. I guess this is a recent development because as of like three, four days ago, he was on the site, so. Yeah, it was... Yeah, it was two days ago, pretty much, that he cancelled, I think, he so... Uh, he just had, yeah. his, uh, he had a child. He had um, the birth of a child last week with his yeah. new wife, Sarah, so I know that happened. Uh, maybe he needs to uh, devote that time to being a uh, you know, new father again, because that's, that's his third child. I know his two, uh, his two older uh, children, very nice kids, and uh, but he was recently married a couple of uh, years ago to... Um, it's new bride Sarah, and they just had to, they just delivered a baby days ago, not even a week ago, I don't think. So, um, you know, priorities, I understand. Exactly. So, moving on to my sixth question, as well as acting, you used to work as an assistant editor on films. Do you plan to get back into Are editing sure at some uh, point? In the mid to late 90s, I worked over at Warner Brothers at Burbank. For the record, it's the best studio to work at, for sure. The facilities are beautiful. The people at the <laughs> lot, I mean, it has the biggest, uh, you know, uh, number of employees on one lot. It's a beautiful facility. It's across the street, kind of, from Universal Studios that everybody knows well for the back lot, the, the back lot tour. But, uh, in fact, Warner Brothers is the coveted place by a crew uh, in Los Angeles. Everybody wants to work at the Warner lot because it's just uh, so pleasant and beautiful. And uh, I did work there. Uh, but I, I campaigned to, to get a job there because at that point I was, um, I'd li I've been living in L.A. for years at that point, um, you know, trying to break into me acting. Um, I thought maybe uh, something that uh, would uh, facilitate that would be working, you know, um, right, right, in, uh, right at the studio. So uh, I went to um, a temp agency because uh, there was a temp agency somebody turned me on to. It was in Hollywood. It was on Sunset Boulevard. And they catered specifically to only um, industry, uh, to, to industry, uh, to, to, for industry jobs. And I, I signed up with that uh, placement agency. And, uh, you know, eventually they got me a job, but it was at some mass duplication facility down near uh, the airport very far the opposite way of you know so far away it was in this industrially industrialized zone and i was uh you know making um 
tapes of shows that were to be distributed to uh, affiliate networks of whatever studios around the world. So I was just watching a thousand machines whirring and tapes going and, you know, it was one of those kind of things. It was hardly a creative job. Um, eventually that ended and I went back to that agency and said, look, can you really concentrate on the industry and perhaps something that's closer to Hollywood here? I was living in West Hollywood at the time. They got me a job at Interscope Records for three months and I worked in payroll there. I was readily fired from that, although they were going to buy me off the agency because I'd said some some things that upset them. They kind of admitted to me that there was a lot of like a propaganda in the music industry. I won't get into it, but one day my desk was cleared after lunch and they said, if you feel this way about the music industry, maybe you should be working in it. And we paid you out to the end of the week, blah, blah, blah. So then after that, I said, you know, I went back to the agency. I said, listen, I don't want to do mass duplication of tapes. I don't want to be, uh, you know, working for the music industry. You know, um, and uh, can you get me something physically on a lot at Fox, at Sony, you're at Warner Bros., preferably in features, if not, uh, you know, television. Well, they fulfilled that. They got me a job at Warner Brothers. I started as a PA uh, at uh, Feature Post, which is only, should be just called Feature Productions because there's no really feature pre-production department. There's no such thing. Each show has their own pre-production. It's called somebody's living room where they're calling to, you know, people begging for financing. That's pre-production. Um, but in this case, it was feature post-production. I got a job there. I was a PA. So literally, I was just like, just like gophering, you know, material and uh, letters and tapes and stuff around this very expansive Warner Brothers lot, which is like 40,000 employees. So in that first year, I got to know the whole of the studio not to mention the studio system that I was already enamored by for decades because since I was a child, right? I knew what was going on already. But uh, eventually, um, you know, they were happy with my work. They bought me off my, uh, my agency. I bypassed a whole bunch of other people that were in the Warner Brothers temp pool that were kind of, you know, they were supposed to graduate into that job. A lot of people were very cheesed when I got that job, but I did my job and I did it well as a temp for the first six months. They bought me off the temp agency. I became a full time uh, Warner Brothers employee and in our department overhead I found out that uh, you know they could also finance uh, school so I went for almost two years I went to UCLA at night and worked and they uh, they uh, sent me to post-production with features and TV school as well as you know my shift because you don't see my name in the credits of movies because I worked and in, um, in editing for all the shows that were shooting at Warner Brothers. All their editing suites or, you know, the spaces where they were doing post-production of these movies were found somewhere on the lot. So, you know, from any given amount of hours to days, I could be at Matrix because we got a bunch of visual effects elements or there's like 10,000 feet of footage that was shot yesterday in Sydney and we need a whole bunch of other people to cut in these, uh, you know, the, these, um, cut the dailies or sync them and, you know, pop track. There was a whole bunch of duties. So once I got the training and became an apprentice editor first, I got sent all around the lot to to you know to assist their already um, existing um, uh, editing teams. Um, so I would do that for years, and then I graduated to becoming an assistant editor. They're very different. Apprentice editor has certain duties, and the apprentice and then there's an assistant editor. And then uh, when I became an assistant editor, I also packed up my stuff and I moved to Vancouver for a handful of years to, uh, to, to try acting. And that took off immediately. And uh, although I had credits already, you know, acting, and I'd done like 30, 40 commercials in Los Angeles. I made lots of money doing commercials. But, uh, you know, when I went up to Vancouver, I, I became an assistant editor and I, I, I worked on a few films. Again, temping. I was in the temp pool of the IATSE uh, union office in Vancouver, so they call me when somebody needed to be replaced or somebody was sick in one of these Hollywood features, so I'd do that. But eventually, my, also uh, in Vancouver, my acting started to really take off, so I had to abandon the uh, the editing. Um, but really, to answer your question, did I do I want to return to it? Well, you know, I cut my demos, I cut friends' demos here and there, but um, uh, to be honest, I, I never sat there creatively cutting uh, storytelling with the with the head editor, the editor that gets his name on the on on the one sheet on the on the movie poster, that's the editor. He can have a team of up to thirty people under him, depending on the size of, of the production, under him. Um, you know, 
feeding him all the media so that he can cut peacefully in his room in front of his avid system, you know, in front of his monitors. Uh, so occasionally I'd go and uh, lean over his shoulder and would say, maybe you can do this, maybe you can do that, and use some ideas. But um, editing is a very, very hard craft. Um, you know, you, there's only a limitation of what you can learn. After that, it's just inherent storytelling ability, you know, how you can process in your mind or visually see the best directors. You know, they'll come under budget and under schedule because they're editing in their mind already. They're not going to waste any footage. They got that, uh, you know, they got that little clip that they're going to use in their sequence, and they'll they'll give, they'll yell cut. That's it. That's all I need. But he didn't even finish his sentence. I don't even need to finish the the actor's sentence because I'm going to cut to the, the reverse angle of this. Per Editing is a very difficult uh, uh, craft, and um, and the editors that win. Like a friend of mine, Joel Cox, he works for Malpaso Entertainment. He's cut everything for uh, you know Clint Eastwood. I used to talk to him every day. Learning, um, he won his first Oscar for Unforgiven. You know, he was nominated for uh, for American Sniper. So a lot of these big editors I got to hang around with. And before my shift started at Warner Brothers, I'd often come in for years at a time. I'd come in at 6 a.m. as opposed to 8. And uh, you know, in conjunction with my schooling at night, I'd be learning for a couple hours before my official shift from world-class editors. Another one's Frank Uriasti. He won an Oscar for cutting uh, Die Hard. Like, he was another another mentor of mine. So I hung around with these guys for years, for hours, uh, you know, and chew their ear or watch them work. Or sometimes I'd sit them and watch, and watch them creatively cut movies. And I'd sit there and listen to everything that I could absorb. Um, but again, uh, these, these guys that are the best at the top of their game, they're, they're deserved of it because they have a, they've worked at it. They have the seniority. And uh, they will certainly have the, the natural talent uh, and ability to do it. So it's very difficult. I cannot say that I'll just step and waltz right back in because I never was a creative editor. I was, um, you know, uh, just just um, somebody that was contributing to their creative cutting, you know. So, But if I could go back and work with Warner Brothers, I'd, I'd, I'd do that. That's probably my second best memory in life and in, in the industry, aside from acting. Uh, I loved every... Every moment that I, I worked at Warner Brothers, um, the, other than acting, that was my favorite job ever. I love everybody that I know that, are, that I consider friends over at the Warner lot, and there's, there's hundreds of them still, and I, I visit there often. It's a beautiful place filled with beautiful people, and it's a movie-making you know, factory. I just love being there. And um, If I could, you know what? Sometimes it gets lean between gigs, acting gigs, and you know, I've actually uh, considered going back, but you know, people misinterpret that. But I actually love the job, and I love the people I work with. And I go back, and sometimes I stay there for days. <laughs> so, um, yeah, maybe I would. I wouldn't go back. I, would, I loved my job. I loved being there, you know. And I lived across the street from the studio, so it was like living at the studio. My gym was there. My bank was there. It's, it's, it's loaded with restaurants in there. Um, so I was practically living in the studio for years in Burbank. And uh, I go back there as much as I can. That's great. That's really great. So, moving on to my final question: Do you have any upcoming acting roles or any other projects you would like well, to have, talk uh, about? I have uh, three indies that I've done in the last couple of years, and um, to tell you the truth, I know two of them. I've just landed distribution deals. There's going to be press releases, so uh, you know, tune in in the next week or so because uh, that's going to be announced. I can't uh, discuss those. Um, the three movies themselves being uh, the Lady Killers. Uh, it's a dark uh, romantic comedy. Uh, there's the Western. It's kind of a revisionist Western. And uh, there's something called Always, also known as Inflection. That was a Hong Kong, Shanghai shot uh, indie as well. And um, they, yeah, like I said, two of them are, have distribution deals that they just landed. They'll all be coming, uh, you know, screened somewhere. Uh, it's it's a, it's a weird, it's a weird launch rollout time for any kind of films now because um, I'm not too familiar exactly if it's going to be released. I know there can be limited theatrical releases, you know, a week or two in some uh, select markets, but, um, you know, they'll eventually be available on VOD, I'm sure, if not Netflix and Amazon Prime. But again, I'm really not familiar with that administrative bureaucratic side. I try to keep that as a distance or I'll lose my mind. Um, but they're coming out, and I am off to start shooting something else in a month, but uh, I cannot talk about it, unfortunately. 
Okay, great. So I'll be sure to keep an eye out for like, news on all of those indie yeah. projects you mentioned. So, so that's all of our questions for you today, Peter. It's been a pleasure talking Maureen, to you on the my podcast. Talking to you. I'm glad I have a fan in Dublin. I have a lot of Irish friends, and you know, every St. Patrick's Day, I go out and I party. I'm looking for my Irish fans, so uh, I'm shouting out to you, all of you, in, in Belfast, everywhere, Dublin. Come visit me down in London. I'll be there in a couple weeks. Yeah, we'll be sure to do so. So hopefully we can talk yeah, to you like again time, at some you know, point. I'd love to talk to you again, Rory. Thanks again. Uh, like I said, it's surreal. It's um, I'm very flattered every time someone, especially across the world, wants to talk to me. You know, I'm just a, I'm just some punk from Canada. So you know, it's very hard for me to accept. You know, <laughs> but uh, I really appreciate. It. I really do appreciate it, Rory. You're very welcome. So I'll talk to you again soon. Then bye and thanks okay, again for it. joining us. So that was our interview with actor Peter Shinkoda. I hope you enjoyed listening to it. So make sure to check out our podcast links 